Welcome to Comic Book Corner. I'm Dan DeLatore. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, before we begin, let's do our shout out uh, of, of the of the evening. And that is to my good friend, uh, Chris from, uh, from Journos Comics. Now I had picked this, this, uh, this shout out. I, I love everyone in, in the community and I'm on a number of shows. And if you had turned, tuned into Chris's show yesterday, there was a bit of a controversy. We'll be talking about this later on in the broadcast. But um, when I first started watching um, uh, YouTube shows, at first it was Comic Tom, and then I guess there's an algorithm that YouTube has, and they, they show you different shows, and Journals was the next one, and here's this guy, Chris, and I started listening to him. I, I liked the guy. I reached out to him. We became friends, and I, I sponsored his show. Um, now, the thing is, with, uh, with the, the controversy at, at, at the moment, Chris is someone that's very, very passionate. Uh, he's someone that uh, he's, he lives on. He, he lives his life on his sleeve. In other words, he says what's on his mind. Now he may be very, very uh, vocal and very, very uh, pronounced with his with his opinions. But Chris is a friend, and he's honest. And that's the thing I love about this guy. Uh, he, he's very, very passionate, and I appreciate that. But again, you can't damn his honesty. Uh, check out Journos Comics and Pop Culture. He does have great content regarding comics. He's very down to earth, very honest, and he is a friend of mine. And I certainly recommend his channel. Let's move on uh, to our next segment, and that's the economy. And I'm sorry to keep bringing this up. I, I actually I'm getting tired of bringing this up. But if I, I think if I'm serving the community, I want to give accurate information, and we are not getting accurate information with our economy. Again, we are part of a large comic book community, a large economy. Last year, celebrating over nine billion dollars of transactions, the economy is on a downturn. On August 5th, um, the jobs report came out from the Labor Department, and it reported over 500,000 new jobs in that particular month of July. Now, what the media didn't say, and especially CBS News, they had said, well, wow, uh, 500,000 jobs, there probably is no recession. Look how great things are. What they and the rest of the media did not report to you was that over 300,000 of these jobs are part-time jobs taken by people who are already full-time. They're taking these part-time jobs because they cannot afford to live with just their uh, their full-time job, and they simply don't want to either exhaust their savings, their 401k, or they simply can't survive. 80,000 plus of those uh, jobs of the 500,000 were people who took second full-time jobs. This is a this is not a bad, uh, not a good sign, people, not a good sign whatsoever. But your media is not telling you the truth on the economy. We are in a hard recession, and that coupled with very high inflation is a very bad recipe. Now, again, I'm going to keep throwing out the red flag of, of caution because, again, I want you to enjoy the hobby, but don't get burned because of, of what information you are not hearing from your media. Sadly, you're hearing it on this little comic book show. Let, let's move on to our, our main segment uh, of the title tonight. And um, before I begin, I want to say this is one of the most complex and difficult uh, segments to put together because it's very complex. It's going to go in a number of different directions. And I don't want to come across as the arbiter of all-knowing, all-seeing regarding the comic book world and its history. But since I've been a collector for the longest time, there are a number of gaps and a number of things that, uh, that I've, I've not uh, seen answered not, and haven't even seen certain questions regarding what is what. Now, funny thing is about with the comic world, as old as it is, in next year, I believe, Comics will celebrate its 90th anniversary of when the first comic was made, I think, back in 1932. Baseball has, for example, Cooperstown and the Hall of Fame and sports writers, and they write down literally every fact and figure, so the history is, is, is more black and white. But there is no such arbiter, there is no one organization that makes decisions on things historical regarding comic books. And I wanted to give my perspective, and again, not a professional perspective, but a, an experienced perspective of what I've seen over the years. And let's start right here with the ages themselves. Let's look at the history. I don't think it's hard to figure out that the Golden Age started with Action Comics number 1 and Detective 27 back in 1938 and 1939, respectively, from DC Comics. Marvel countered with their... Uh, superheroes and Marvel Comics number one, and that was the beginning of the boom of, of comic books. But the Silver Age is one of my pet peeves, and I, I, let's start with the, the people that we can lay credit to these ages here. I don't think anyone's going to have any problem with, um, uh, oh, let's, let's, let's look at this here. That uh, I'm not going to talk so much about DC because I wasn't a DC reader. I have nothing against DC. I love the characters. But as a child, it, you know, like mo most kids, you don't have a lot of money. So you only had so much to, to buy. And uh, you, I 
gravitated towards Marvel. I, I wanted the DC but couldn't afford them. And I, I became more of a Marvel aficionado than anything else. But I don't think it's a stretch to say that the Silver Age of DC began with showcase number four. By the way, uh, I am a DC lover because as a child, I loved the, the Red Flash. And if I could get my hands on that comic, I would today, but it's extremely expensive. Uh, but that began the, the Silver Age for DC, and it, it continued with Justice League uh, in 1960. But I don't think there's any argument that the Marvel Silver Age began with Fantastic Four, number one. And the man who should be credited with that is a gentleman we all know, Stan Lee. Stan Lee was, uh, there, there's so many things that can be said about this this genius, uh, the, this person we, we all know and love, and we miss him to this day. He and Jack Kirby were clearly the uh, the arbiters and the people responsible, and we give the most credit for them with the, the Silver Age. Now, with the Bronze Age, uh, the person I personally give credit to is this gentleman, and it's, his name is Roy Thomas. Here he is with Stan Lee at the, towards the end of his life. The two of them were friends. Roy Thomas came into Marvel in the mid-60s, I believe, and he became editor-in-chief of Marvel. Uh, he was the first editor-in-chief after Stan Lee moved on to, to do production and other uh, elements of Marvel as the Marvel was growing thanks to the, the brilliance of the Silver Age. When Roy Thomas took over as editor-in-chief, he inherited a number of different titles. Roy Thomas was credited with so many things, and what he did was he saw what he inherited, he wanted the, the company to grow, and he would he would work with so many writers and artists, and that's why he is credited with co-creating so many characters like Wolverine, uh, Luke Cage, The Invaders, Nighthawk, Ultron, uh, the Valkyrie, and my favorite team of all, the Defenders. But I give him credit as to to being the um, the father of the Bronze Age, if you will, because he set the stage for that very important era. The other era that made importance to all of us, and myself included, was the Copper Era. And I think the person among others that you could choose, but I'm going to choose this one here to be the, the father of the Copper Era, and that's Jim Shooter. Jim Shooter was uh, a brilliant, brilliant individual. Um, he was his probably his most famous work is The Secret Wars, which I believe came out in 1984. Jim Shooter in his early life was very much a savant. He was a brilliant young man. He I, I, I met him years ago. He strikes me as someone who's sort of like um, Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory. He's just a genius, but a bit stoic and not really comfortable with dealing with people. And someone as brilliant as he, and, and I, I don't think it's a stretch to say this man was very, very... Um, he had such a presence to him and, and an understanding of not just comics, but business sense. Uh, he was the one that saved Marvel in the 80s because when he took over as editor-in-chief, Stan Lee clearly saw something in him and br brought him on board. Uh, and he succeeded after a number of people could not handle the editor-in-chief job. But he did a number of things, not just set the stage for the Copper Age, but he set the company on, on, a, on a financial path that led to success because they were going bankrupt. They with all the brilliant people at Marvel at the time, Jim Shooter was the only one who had any real business sense. And he started streamlining the company regarding its production uh, and other aspects that many uh, other people simply couldn't handle. But those are the three people in the three ages that, that, we, that I really appreciated the most. But one thing, uh, among others, that I wanted to address was when the Silver Age began and when it ended. Now, doing some research on this, and I hear Jaw laughing in the background, but we will talk later to that young man. Um, now, again, this is my personal opinion. The research that I found um, was a bit dicey. Uh, the only um, mention was uh, well, probably one of the most reliable sources was Wikipedia. And Wikipedia has actually done a fairly good job, and I know Wikipedia has its own problems re regarding accuracy, but they did say something that I agree with, and that is regarding the records of comic books in general there really, there really aren't that many records. Again, it's not baseball. It's not the Hall of Fame or the the or Cooperstown. They don't have they. These people were business people. They were trying to make a living. They weren't trying to make history. They were trying to survive like any business was. But I, probably the best uh, article that I'd seen regarding um, when the definition of the Bronze Age began was this one. I'm looking at here on my other computer from a um, website called TV Tropes. And they are confirming what other people are saying, that the, the Bronze Age began in 1970. And my first thought is this. An age or an era is a style or a flavor or an approach, and it unifies the, that same era by, by similarities a, along the way. So what was so special? What, what ended the Silver Age on December 31st, 1969, and why did the Bronze Age begin January 1st, 1970? 
I and the only thing that this article mentions is it was the year that um, Jack Kirby went to D.C. It also no cites the a gentleman by the name of War Mort Wessinger, who was uh, uh, the editor for the uh, Superman titles for the longest time. I guess he had retired and moved on. A few other things, but nothing of these on this article strikes me as the end of an age. What I say is, again, the style, the flavor uh, was very Silver Age-esque. I say that the Silver Age ended around 1974. And the reason why is because the stories, again, the stories are very Silver Age-esque. The artwork was, was very Silver Age. Even the paper quality and the size of the comic was the same. In fact, I just ordered some comics today. They just happened to show up today. And I'll give you an example, which I don't normally do on my, my show, but this is clearly a Silver Age book. It's a Strange Tales book, number 131, and you can see the size of it. This is a uh, 20 cent book, Savage uh, Submariner 67. As you can tell, they're both the same size as far as width. They're both in Silver Age Mylar. Uh, but the transition for the, the trimming of the size of the comic started in the 25 cent era. It, not all 25 cent books are that way because here's a 25 center. This was made a year later, Submariner 62. They're all the same size. This was two years later. This is a super villain team up number, number six. And you can tell it's noticeably smaller than the others. You can't put a Silver Age book in a modern sleeve, uh, but that began in, in the mid-70s. But that, that's one element of it. But the other element, too, was, and that is when Stan Lee, who was still in charge of production at the time, he knew that the comics were going up in price, and they were moving from 20 cents to 25 cents, so that's a 20% increase. Stanley who was always thinking business, and he had this brilliant idea, quote unquote, to put something uh, in, in addition for kids to collect as they bought these comics. It was called the Marvel Value Stamp. That way they wouldn't care about the extra five cents that they were spending, and they wanted to collect all these, one through a hundred of them. And you can see to the right is the book that they uh, issued. Pardon me. And so the, the idea was you collect all 100 of these, you put them in this book, you send it to Marvel Comics, and you get some sort of discount or whatever the prize was. Now, it might have seemed like a brilliant idea at the time, but anyone who owns a Hulk 181 and turns to that certain page and sees that cutout is horrified to see that Marvel value stamp gone. So, um, But that started at the 20 cent era and continued on. It, it was at the last 20 cent issue of every comic and then moved on to the 25 cent issue. So uh, from 25 cents on, I think for about a year or maybe less, all those Marvel stamps were in. But that was a transitional period. And again, uh, looking at the, uh, the the quality of the paper, the ink work, that had to cost Marvel some money. And this is why I believe Stanley decided to raise the price a 20 cents to that 25 cent era because he was gearing up towards more uh, a, a better books uh, that, that would last longer because he saw the competition. DC was doing the same thing. So again, that is a sizable transition to see the uh, a difference between Silver Age ending and, and the Bronze Age beginning. So when will the Bronze Age begin? If I, again, this is my opinion, it's, it should be in uh, 1974. The Bronze Age lasted, I would say, till about um, 19, uh, when, when I had my notes here, I'd say 1986. And then the Copper Age would begin 1987. That would be uh, the 25th anniversary issues uh, of Marvel Comics. The Copper Age, I would say, lasted to the mid-90s, let's say 97-ish. Now, there's no exact date on these. But again, uh, I don't like the fact that the, that the so-called powers that be are saying there is an exact date of when the Silver Age ended. 1970 simply doesn't work for me. I'd like, if there is, if is, and by the way, this is an open discussion for anyone in the chat. You can talk to me on the air or leave something on my IG or leave something if you're seeing this on the Rewind. If you have an opinion on this, John, I'm talking to you, uh, please let me know. And uh, I'd love to have an open discussion. Again, these are my experienced opinions. But also one last thing about the Bronze Age. Um, I was alive and well in the Bronze Age when uh, in, 19, in the 1970s and buying comics. We didn't call them Bronze Age at the time. Those were brand new comics. Now, the Silver Age definition had been established, but again, I, I suppose you put two and two together, the Bronze Age would follow. But when I was buying them, they weren't called Bronze Age. I think there needs to be a review of what is what regarding that age. But sadly, there really is no uh, organization that I can find anywhere that has any uh, determination whatsoever. So I'd hope, I'm hoping 
if I could change anything regarding the comic history, it would be the definition of when the Bronze Age started and when the Silver Age ended. There are a few other questions that, I, that, that come to mind as well that, again, I'd like to have an open discussion if you have them, uh, questions that you've had that you've not seen answered, or you've not even see, seen asked. So let's move on uh, to some of our, our, our other images here. Uh, Avengers 4. Here's a question I've never heard posed. We all know the famous story of Avengers 4. By the way, I'm a proud owner of that signed by Stan Lee. Uh, the, the story goes, if you've not heard it, uh, uh, the Submariner uh, rescues a uh, frozen Steve Rogers, uh, rescues him from the ice. He's brought back to life uh, by the Avengers. And the story is told of when he was frozen in the ice somewhere around the end of World War II. What Marvel or anyone else has never addressed is, when is that time? When was the last Golden Age appearance of Stan Lee? When was he thrown into this ice? If I had to take an educated guess, it would be this issue here to the left. That is All Winners number 21. That is an incredibly rare book. I, I almost had one in a bid, but it, it's an extremely pricey book. There's, uh, there's, only, there's only 100 that exist. Uh, by the way, as an aside, there are a few 9.6s of this 1946 book out there, and there is one 9.8. That absolutely blows me away. I have no idea what that would be worth. Now, if the, the connection is made that that is the last Golden Age appearance of the Steve Rogers character, imagine how, how much that would skyrocket um, because of the scarcity of the book. Uh, and it also makes sense because he's with the... Um, the only team that Marvel ever came up with in the Golden Age, that was the All Winter Squad. There were only two issues, issue issue 19, which I did have, which was stolen, sadly, and issue 21, and then it, it sadly ended. Uh, another issue about, uh, pardon me, another question about Avengers 4, since you can see uh, Steve Rogers right next to the Submariner, if he's fighting the Submariner in Avengers 4, how come he, the, the two didn't recognize each other? That also was never addressed, at least not in that issue here. So that's that's one of a number of questions I have. Um, but one of the, the problems I have is that we have, uh, and I think someone touched on it today, oh, it was Hyper, Hyper Combo Comics, touched on this in his uh, on uh, the comic book Kingpins. He said, in essence, that we are sort of the at the mercy of CGC, which is still sadly the top grading company, and whatever they say on their label goes. Now, there are a number of um, characters that, that I would like to see identified. One, one character here is the Valkyrie. The Valkyrie starts in Marvel Comics in Avengers 83. And now this is not, this is just the Valkyrie persona. If you haven't read the story, it's actually the Enchantress posing as the Valkyrie. And uh, but she's revealed again to, to not be the actual Valkyrie. She reappears again in Hulk 142. That was a Roy Thomas story, a fun story, by the way. I, I, I recommend you get your hands on it. But my personal view is that the in fact, I, I don't think this is an opinion. I think it, this is this could be solidified. The first true appearance of the Valkyrie, the Brunhilde Valkyrie, is Defenders 4. But there's no definition from from CGC or anyone else that I can find, even on Wikipedia. They just sort of go down the the, the lineage, if you will, of when the Valkyrie character came up. I, it's not a, a a solid grail or a solid character, but it is a substantial character that I'd like to have some definition for. And I'm certain those watching probably have similar questions. Another one I have to on a more obscure character is is one of my favorites. This character here called Cirrus Black. I always love this character, and I mention this because I think you know, um, with the Doctor Strange characters, uh, he might appear at some point. I just, I just love this character here. But I have a Defender Six CGC. There's no definition and no description that that is his first appearance. And as the one, let's bring up the other one here with Gambit. This is something all of us know because this is more of a modern character. The controversy is when was Gambit's first appearance? Was it um, X-Men Annual 14 or was it X-Men 266? And again, the biggest problem we have is that this is all left up to um, currently CGC and whatever you, you find in, in whatever article, no one seems to have the final say regarding what is uh, as far as def final definition and, and final say except the free the market itself the comic market that's you and I that's why I'm bringing uh, this this question forward to everyone the regarding uh, one of the con controversies is cameos I, it's a pet peeve with mine this is my little joke here the only cameo cameos I accept are the ones that Stan Lee made in his movies that I'm still uh, uh, bothers me that cameo is used uh, for characters like Hulk one um, uh, Wolverine and Hulk 180 
Wolverine never existed for that issue. The, the word cameo is improper, but CGC and others uh, can't seem to shake that for whatever reason, even though the, the and there's John laughing again, we're going to have a great conversation, I can tell afterwards. But anyway, it's still a pet peeve with me, and my experience is that should not be used. But when we were kids, uh, John and I were old enough to remember this book here, the Overstreet book. All you had growing up um, was your Overstreet price guide. You never left home without it if you were a good comic collector. The, to the left is the very first uh, price guide, which is probably very expensive all by itself. It was more of a pamphlet than anything else. But Robert Overstreet did see the value in producing such, such a book, and that clearly grew. And with, with the growth of that book came the database and all the information that's in it. If there's any organization that I would trust even to this day, it's, it's Overstreet because of the massive database that they have um, and what, what they've amassed. I, I, would, I still buy the book to this, to this day just to look through the pictures and the articles and so forth. And by the way, I do, I have found, this is rare to find, a mistake that Overstreet made, which I'll, I'll uh, reveal in the next episode here. It was total, by, totally a, a, a haphazard uh, chance uh, moment, but I did find something that Overstreet has wrong. So I'll, I'll, I'll share that. If anyone else wants to share, please let me know. We'll, we'll uh, throw this into the next episode. But Overstreet has finally uh, begun an online presence and it's called Overstreet Access. Now, I, I didn't access it because there, there's a free service and there's a paid service. And they're sort of going on the lines of Go Collect and Key Collector. And I, I don't subscribe to any one of those, but I do look at Go Collect for just the uh, their, their price structure to have a free service. And they're pretty reliable. Um, I probably, if I wanted to, to pay money, I'd probably buy all three to see what they all, all have to say. I, I'm hoping that Overstreet because they have such a rich database and have such uh, talented people associated with them becomes the that arbiter. I think that is very sorely needed in the comic book market because again, look how many controversies and arguments we've had uh, over the years and there's no one to say, hey guys, this is the final say. At this point, uh, and we'll see what they do with their online service, I'm gonna go with Overstreet simply because they've been at it over half a century. All right guys, let's go to our picks of the week. And um, these picks, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm using some of the um, uh, picks that we had used uh, for the, uh, <coughs> the this segment. Let's start with um, Avengers 83. Let's go back to that panel there. Now, why this uh, might come into play is because at the end of Avengers Endgame, there was a quick little tidbit, a little, little uh, um, uh, Easter egg, if you will, of the uh, later Liberators. Now, I don't think someone like Kevin Feige would throw that out for their most signature movie if they weren't going to expand upon that. That's still fairly reasonable. I would probably invest uh, at least in a mid-grade. I have a couple of these here, and it's it's a pretty fun story, and I think MC, the MCU is going to go in that direction. They certainly went with more female characters uh, in the Bronze Age, and they uh, – I. Um, I, I think the MCU is going to follow suit. Defenders 4, same thing. Oh, Defenders 4 is a little bit different. When Roy Thomas created the Valkyrie, it, it, it was said that um, he created that to be basically a female Thor. Now, we just had the Thor Love and Thunder movie where Jane Foster is in Valhalla. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, she, there's, I think it was someone on this chat, on, on our show, by the way, that suggested she might turn into the Brunhilde Valkyrie. You know, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed female Thor. And I, I can see the connection with that. Defenders 4 is still extremely reasonably priced. Even the, uh, the, the high CGC grades are coming down. Uh, I would get your hands on some. I have several copies. I'd like to get some for myself. And to the right is another one that's probably the, the least valued one, Hulk 142, although it is a great story by Roy Thomas, but they may connect that in some way uh, if they do bring that character forward. The next book we have is again, uh, I think with Gambit on its way, I think it's a sort of a no brainer that you get your hands on either one of these or both. Uh, there, it's it's a modern book, well, modern from my perspective, and they're still they're still out there. I think there's still some money in this one here. I think this one sort of speaks for itself. Gambit, it's sort of a mixed bag with the people that I've listened to. Some people really love this character. Some people can't stand this character. I'm not really sure why, but uh, I I have it. I just happen to fall in, fall into one, but I would get your hands on one if, if I could. Next, we have the um, the Defenders book. Again, back to the Doctor Strange book. I, I We're not done with Doctor Strange. 
uh, with Benedict Cumberbatch, a very young man and a great actor for that particular role, I think they'll be bringing a number of associates, people he had to deal with. Now, he was a villain here in Defenders 4. He became a hero later on. I think it was Strange, uh, pardon me, Doctor Strange 34. It's just one of those fun characters that no one has heard about. I love this character, and I hope he uh, he moves forward in, in the MCU. And he might be a sleeper pick. You never know. That's the thing with the MCU. You never know what they're going to pick. I never knew. I didn't think Guardians of the Galaxy would be a movie, but lo, lo and behold, there it is. Next we have, um, speaking of Secret Wars, we have Secret Wars 2. Now, as I said earlier in the segment that, <coughs> excuse me, this character here is the most powerful. He was the most powerful character in all of Marvel. And I don't know. I mean, you could technically say Secret Wars 1, issue 1, was his first appearance as just a voice. You heard him from afar speaking to everyone, including Galactus. Um, and he did appear in, in mortal form later on in that run. He took over the persona uh, or the body of, uh, of uh, not Kang. Um, oh, he took over a character that I'm drawing a blank on. But he did appear in mortal form towards the end of that series. He appears in multiple forms starting here in, in series one. My recommendation is you get both series if you can. I know issues one and eight are a bit pricey, but it's worth it. The read was great. This is, again, Jim Shooter's creation, and I think he was certainly onto something. This was a brilliant, brilliant move. And with the She-Hulk uh, show coming up starting uh, later this week, I think this is a dynamite character. I think this is going to be a long lasting character. And like the Black Panther character is going to be a long, around for a long time. And I think even as pricey as this book is, I think this is really, really going to move. I think you should probably get your hands on this sooner than later. Hold on to several copies. I have a really nice high grade copy. I wish I had more, but I certainly recommend um, this book um, to, to seek out uh, sooner than later. Everyone in the next episode, um, let's continue on this because, again, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to have stirred the pot. I know one person, we won't make any mention of his name, Joe, uh, has uh, had comments on this and thoughts, and I'd love to hear them. And, again, I am not the arbiter of everything. I, I'm just an experienced old collector. I've seen it a lot. I love this community. I love the comic books. I'd love to have this open discussion because no one else is having this discussion. I think there's questions that need to be posed and more importantly, need to be answered. Everyone, thanks for joining for the Ian Hoodrat Network. I'm Dan DeLatore, and this is Comic Book Corner.